Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Folks, I'd like to introduce Angela Johnson. You may know Angela Johnson from Collaborative Leadership Team based in Minneapolis and transforming the world of work for all the companies there. What you may not know is that Minneapolis is home to the headquarters of more Fortune 500 companies than any other metro area in the world. Yeah. So their hub there is influencing the headquarters of more Fortune 500 companies than any metro area globally. And Angela leads that group. What you also may know is Angela is a competitive yacht racer. And being based here, <laughs> and being based here at the marina for the San Diego gathering is bringing two passions and joys together. I hope most of you have had many hallway conversations with Angela and gotten to join the collaborative leadership team to talk about Scrum at Scale, their partnership with Scrum Inc., and the work they're doing with global company headquarters. Now, I'd ask you to put your hands together to welcome Angela to give a fantastic presentation to help us close the last day here of the Scrum Gathering San Diego. Angela Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. I'm all mic'd up. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to spare my slide because Joe did a fabulous job of introducing me. I wanna start with the three goals I have for you for this session. First, to understand no matter what they tell you, Scrum is really about people. It's really about people working together. So I want us to focus on the people aspect of this and then give you some very practical tools you can use that don't necessarily come from the Scrum or Agile community, but they come from psychology. And then finally, some coaching tips that you can immediately use when you leave here. Now, of course, we're gonna start with a test. Many of you may have seen my friend Stuart Young and his wonderful drawings right outside the room. Maybe you learned to draw this week in his visualization workshop. So we're gonna give you a little test. You're gonna start by drawing. Now here's what I need you to draw. No disrespect to the chickens in the room, I would like you to draw a pig. You have three minutes with the tools provided to draw a pig. Start drawing. And uh, you're welcome, Mr. Justice, because I chose your theme song. Okay, so let's look at the results of the test. One of the things I'm going to be sharing with you is influences from other disciplines. And one of those is Dale Carnegie principles. And it's a Dale Carnegie principle to let the other person save face. So you do not need to share the results of your pig drawing unless you want to. You are empowered. That's up to you. But we have what it means psychologically on the screen for you. So look at where you put the pig on the paper. Did you put it on the top? Because then you're a pretty positive person. Did you put it in the middle? You tend to be more of a realist. But at the bottom of the page, you tend to be a little more pessimistic or prone to behaving negatively. How about the direction? Was your pig facing left? Because if they were facing left, you're kind of a traditionalist. Right? But you, you, know, you might remember dates easily because that's all important to you. But if your pig is facing to the right, you may not necessarily remember that stuff because you don't have a strong sense of family or that background. And if it's facing front, you are my direct folks, right? You just cut right to the chase and you do not shy away from confrontation. So let's look at the details. Does your pig have a lot of details? You know, like you did some work on the eyes, you did something on the expression. Because if you put a lot of details, you're our analyticals. You, you want those details. And you may be cautious to the point that you struggle a little bit with trust. Those of you who kept it simple, you're our strategic thinkers. You're our big picture thinkers. You look at the big picture and you don't sweat the small stuff. You can go back in for the details later. The challenge there is sometimes you're a little reckless with your decision making. But now let's talk about appendages. Do you have four legs? 
Because if you have less than four legs, that might indicate that you're struggling with some insecurity. If you have four legs, that does mean you're secure and you stick to those ideals, uh, but some people might see that as a little bit stubborn. Ears, this might sound like, you know, duh, we get it. The bigger the ears, the better the listener. Now let's talk about your tail. The longer the tail, the more intelligent you are. <laughs> yeah, I notice everybody's comparing right about now. <laughs> So now, now that we've given you a fun retrospective tool to use for people to get a little bit more self-awareness, or heck, maybe just a fun party trick, let's get into the meat of some more of this psychological stuff. So I'm going to first talk about what we don't mean. In his keynote, Dr. Sutherland reminded us that there's a lot of fake scrum out there. There's a lot of waterfall being called agile or scrum. So the Scrum Master is not a secretary. Coaching the product owner on backlog refinement doesn't mean becoming their administrative assistant or starting to be the person that owns that artifact. Coaching the development team also is pretty important. You want them working together. You want them working in a cross-functional way. If you as the Scrum Master step in and start doing those tasks yourself, you actually create a condition called learned Helplessness. Did you know that? Because if you are preventing them from learning, they're never going to learn for themselves. And why should they? You're doing all the work for them. And we want a learning organization. We do not want an organization of learned helplessness. So be, be very mindful of that. My team has a little saying. When we see scrum masters going in to touch the team's work, we say, get your hands off the team's work. Get your hands off the product owner's work because you're quite frankly missing what you should be focusing on. And that's the outcomes and the people and making everybody more awesome. You're not a go-between. You're not a bottleneck. That's not what this is about. So what I see new scrum masters do, and I put myself in that category, you guys, if I could get in my DeLorean and go back in time to when I was a scrum master, I focused on the perceived administrivia. I focused on getting ready for retros and sprint planning. And yes, those things are important. But what we tend to miss is the people stuff. And due to the fact that we're collaborating and we're getting together more often, the people stuff just bubbles right up to the surface. I can be heard saying over and over again in classes or when we're coaching, what you have here isn't a scrum problem. You have a people problem. And then my scrum masters say, well, now what? <laughs> right? how, do, how do we fix that if it were that easy? And the manifesto and the guide are supposed to be our documents, right? The ones that we can fall back on for our guidelines, for our rules. And they remind us, yes, this is all about people, individuals and interactions, collaboration. But how do we do that? Right? How do we do that? So we're going to give you some tools to help you improve those people skills. I'm going to start from inside the community. Anybody see MJ this week? Michael James was here, it was good to see him. Uh, he is the author of the Scrum Master Checklist. If those of you have, who have not checked it out, I highly recommend this. MJ put this together years ago, and it's just kind of the definitive day in the life of a Scrum Master. It's about seven or eight pages long. So I hand that to Scrum Masters and go, you wanna know what your day is supposed to look like? Check this out. And oh, by the way, he gives it to the world for free and it's translated in multiple languages. So I get a phone call from one of my graduates and she says, I got that checklist and I read it. I said, good, what's your question? This is all people stuff, Angela. Yes, I know. <laughs> Somebody resembling me mentioned that a few times, right, in class. She said, there's nothing on here about running the retro and running the planning. I said, I know. So now think about the fact that you have to do those in addition to all this stuff. Still think it's a part-time job? Still think you can be a great scrum master of multiple teams? And I have a question for those of you who are taking on multiple teams. Which one's your favorite? <laughs> what do you do when they all have needs from you? How do you choose? And what your leadership doesn't understand is they just gave you 
a built-in excuse. Oh, I'm too busy with team A, so I can't, oh, I'm too busy. When you are a 100% dedicated scrum master, guess what? No excuses. That team should be improving. So we give kind of that built-in excuse, and again, that falls back into the organization, creating learned helplessness. So this is one of our favorite tools from inside our own community. So let's look outside the community. 25 years ago, when I was coming out of college and wondering what I wanted to be when I grew up, I landed over at Dale Carnegie Training. And I was fortunate enough to be one of their employees. And as an employee, they put us all through human relations training, and we got copies of Dale's books. So I'm not going to read through all the principles. You can do that when you have time. And many of them might seem pretty self-explanatory. But I want to point out one in particular that's near and dear to my heart. And that one is appealing to nobler motives. This aligns perfectly with servant leadership. Because servant leadership isn't about you, right? Oh, you have to schedule your sprint planning around me because I have multiple teams. It falls apart very quickly, doesn't it? And when we talk about nobler motives in Scrum, that's our sprint goal. That's showing potentially shippable product increments with each sprint and raising people up, getting everybody to be better than they were. So it aligns perfectly with what the Scrum framework is reinforcing. So Scrum Masters can really focus on appealing to the nobler motives. When you do that, it also refocuses everybody and gets them out of the weeds or focusing on what little minor details they might have been sweating and gets them back to the big picture. My favorite source, of course, and the title of this talk, inspired by Dr. Harvey Robbins. Now, Dr. Harvey Robbins does live in Minneapolis, so I get him all to myself, but I want to share him with the world. Harvey's career started out in the CIA. So as a licensed psychologist, he was putting high-performing teams together from a psychological point of view, right? So, you know, teams that we only read about in spy novels or, you know, in Jason Bourne movies. So Harvey loves to work in the private sector now using the tools that he crafted throughout his CIA and subsequently FBI experience in the private sector. And when I was talking to Harvey about getting ready for this talk, and we had put a webinar together that some of you saw on this information a year ago, I said, you know, you are a psychologist because people go, what do I do about all this people stuff? I'm like, I am not a psychologist, but I know one, right? And as I was talking about the title, he said, but Angela, you aren't a psych psychologist or an armchair. So how is that going to go over? I said, I'm just going to refer them all to you, Doc. So the way I met him, I was sitting in an audience, much like you guys are right now, at a talk he was giving. And he misses the CIA desperately. So he loves to make really bad jokes when he starts his presentations. At the time, I was going through a pretty contentious divorce. And Harvey said, who here would like to talk about killing people? <laughs> right? And as I look around the room, I'm like, oh, I'm the only one raising my hand. Yet. And he just kind of gave me this look. And as he starts explaining his psychological background and studies, he brings up the Enneagram. I'd studied the Enneagram for 12 years. Most people can't pronounce it, let alone know what it is. So he says, I'm sure none of you know the Enneagram. Right? And he's like, you and I probably need to talk later, he says. <laughs> and then he moves on with his talk. And as he puts up slide after slide, he's like, hey, I'm going to tell you that bad teams have vague goals and objectives, and that's probably not a secret. Good teams seem to have clearer goals, but the best teams, the high-performing teams, have short-term, continuous, high-priority goals that they re-evaluate every 30 days or less. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, so I was sitting in my chair going, he's talking about Scrum, right? He puts up another slide. Hey, bad teams, they don't pay attention to the barriers, right, or the impediments. Good teams, well, they might engage in some barrier identification, but the best teams identify barriers, and those could be people, those could be process, those could be structures, and then they develop versatility and contingency plans around those barriers. I'm like, he's totally talking about Scrum. How come I've never heard of this guy? And then he goes on to say, bad teams ignore the people stuff. 
They just ignore the people stuff. Good teams will recognize that we're a little different, but the best teams value the differences in each other and develop those versatility plans to achieve the mission and work together. And I raised my hand, I said, you're talking about Scrum. He goes, no, really, I need to talk to you after. <laughs> He's like, what the hell is Scrum? And I, of course, give you know, all my little 15 minute spiels and he, Harvey says, so I was Scrum, I was doing Scrum before I even knew what that was. And we've worked together ever since. So like I said, I'm lucky to have him in the Twin Cities, but I'm sharing his work with the world here today. So what does he mean by versatility? This goes beyond adapting. You know, we talk about adapting in Scrum all the time. Okay, we get it. That might be too vague when you're talking about this people stuff. So we have to plan to have a versatility plan, which means putting yourself in the other person's shoes and seeing things from their point of view, not to become a chameleon, not to become a yes person or to be all things to all people. That's not what we're talking about. We're saying if you can appreciate how that other person may want to receive the information, now you can better prepare your message so that it lands more effectively. That's what we're talking about. So we don't want you know, to be all things to all people, and we don't want to try to fix someone else. We will save that for the psychologists, because so many times people come to our classes or they come into a coaching session and they have a laundry list of things they want to fix in somebody else, right? Oh, if only so-and-so was here hearing this. Oh, you know who really needs to hear this? You kind of miss the point when we say those things. Who should we start with? ourselves, right? We should start building that awareness in ourselves and then seek to understand and build that versatility plan to become a more effective coach by coaching the person in front of us, not trying to fix someone. So it's more about being who we need to be to better interact with the people presenting the information. Okay, here comes the psychology. So uh, you probably have done like a Myers-Briggs or a DISC, any of those kinds of things? Yeah. So what Harvey says is those tend to type you. They're gonna put you in a little box, they're gonna give you a personality type, and then say this is the box you're in. But we miss the point. So the bigger thing that they should be focusing on is behaviors. Because that's quite frankly what we're talking about when we're trying to work together as a team. So this is loosely based on the Enneagram, and I won't bore you with that. That's a lot of heavy reading, so go check that out. But what the Enneagram does differently than something like the Kiersey Temperament Model, Myers-Briggs, and so on, is it allows for change. It says, yeah, you have a home plate. You have a home base. You know, when push comes to shove, nine times out of 10, here's the behaviors you gravitate towards. But it allows for the fact that as human beings, we don't stay in that home plate. We move based on who's interacting with us, what's happening in the conditions or the environment, and we can take on what the Enneagram calls wings of another behavior pattern. So when you look at these behavior patterns, I'm gonna have you guys again, I'll let you say face, you don't have to blurt yours out loud, Nigel. So you just have to like, you know, maybe make a little note of which ones you are, and it's really easy for us to identify with what we perceive as the positive behaviors up there. And it, you know, we may not want to own up to the negative behaviors, but I would invite you to be as honest as you can because it's pretty difficult for us to ever really see ourselves as we are. It's more about then finding out how other people see you based on the way you're behaving. So here's the grid that he shares with the world. Is Bernie here? Is Bernie Maloney here? Bernie was so excited that I cited the source because he's another uh, psychological friend here in the, in the community and he's wondered for years where this came from. So he was excited that I gave the source. So let me explain the grid very briefly because there's a lot of information on this simple diagram. So when we talk about left to right, this is measuring kind of where you are in your assertiveness. Do you prefer to ask questions? Do you prefer to tell a story or give an example? Top down is kind of your reaction. 
So do you behave in a controlled manner in response to things, or do you respond very emotionally when presented with information? The other thing that each behavior pattern is dominated by is a need to know something. I'm that person that needs to know why. You gotta start with the why with me, otherwise I cannot move beyond understanding what the heck is going on. Our drivers need to know what. No, no, I just need to know what it is. Just, just tell me what we're trying to do. Our analyticals, of course, wanna know the how. They wanna know how we're gonna get this done. And our amiables, our people people, just wanna know who's involved because then they can make better choices about who's going to be affected. So Harvey calls it the magic question when we say things like, why are we doing this? What is it? How are we gonna do it? And who's it for? Because you kind of hit all the behavior patterns. And then everybody feels inclusive. They feel heard. And you don't have to do them all at once. You know, you could do those separately. But let's start with our drivers. These are our action-oriented people, right? Just let me do it. Just, just let me get her done. They're very in the moment, so they gravitate towards the controlling response and giving direction. Our expressives, this is the box I'm in. I know you're so shocked. I love to tell my stories. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I you know, make decisions very intuitively, just off the cuff. Our amiables are all about the relationship. They're all about, hey, tell me who this is for so that I can better understand, there are empathy, folks, what to do next. And then our analyticals, those are the ones that want their 40 meg pivot table. Those are the ones that want the spreadsheet, just give me the data, come to me with the data. And our analyticals, of course, then, not only are our thinkers, they're looking at past. They're looking back because they want to look for patterns and looking at that data. So once again, you may have a home plate. So on our previous slide, I showed you the behaviors, and if you can figure out which one you have more of, that tells you which of our dominant behavior patterns you fall into. And then you move based on who's interacting with you. Now here's where it gets really interesting for teams. Diagonally across the grid is what Harvey calls a toxic relationship. Those are the, those are the behavior patterns that just repel each other and push each other's buttons unless they have done some work to acknowledge those, and they have mutually agreed upon a versatility plan. Now maybe this week you've also heard that referred to team working agreements, team norms, whatever that is. So when those plans are in place and they're adhered to, things go very well. When people are not willing to adhere to those, that's when things crash and burn. So when people come at me and just want to go right to the details and they want the data, the data, the data, it pushes me here, right? I, and when the amiables come at me, because they're, the, they're, they're our people people, they love telling stories, they love listening to stories. Oh, I go right there, right? I gravitate towards the other side of the circle. So you can use this even as a simple retrospective technique with your teams to not only first increase awareness, but now let's talk about what we're gonna do about it. And here's why I love the good doctor. He dumbs all the psychobabble down into lists of do and do not. <laughs> so this is why we love his information. So he says, let's start with the drivers, because these guys are pretty tough. You are gonna be brief. You are gonna be to the point, right? Just the facts. Don't sugarcoat it. You're gonna ask very specific questions. You are not gonna leave them hanging. You are not gonna ask rhetorical questions or forget things or be unorganized, that drives them crazy. And there are two slides of information about our drivers. Why? Because they're the most difficult. Even with other drivers, these are, these are the tough ones. So we wanna give our drivers choices, but they have to be rooted in fact. They have to be rooted in facts and figures they can't just be about fluff. And you gotta keep it about business. It's not personal, it's just business. We focus on the facts. And when the conversation is over, leave. You don't hang out and try to just chit chat. That drives them absolutely crazy. You don't wanna give them these wild what if scenarios because that's prone to speculation. And you don't uh, direct or order 
a driver. That won't go over very well. <laughs> Our expressives. So you do need to leave time with the expressives for socializing. That is very important to the expressives, right? You can't just dive in about the business of the facts that drives us nuts. Because we will inevitably you know, get back to the socializing if that need hasn't been satisfied. And then things will just kind of go off the rails. With expressives, we do not like judgments. We don't like harsh judgments. We don't like dogma. And we don't like people who condescend us, right? Who talk down to us. The amiables, the people people, want to start with a personal comment. They do want to know what's going on in your world. So again, we have to leave a little time for the amiables not to rush into business, but to have a little time to com have a conversation. We don't want to patronize them or, or be uh, demeaning to them. So to share a little um, insight into our team, some of you have met our scrum master here this week, Dee Rhoda, who's amazing. Uh, my business partner, Christian Antoine, is an amiable. Christian is our people person. And in fact, we've gotten so goofy with some of this stuff at CLT that we even have dog personas. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm, of course, the expressive. So what our wise scrum master has done, regardless of whether we're doing a daily scrum, regardless of whether we're doing a sprint review or a retrospective, she time boxes the chit chat for Angela and Christian. We gotta have our socialization time. We gotta say, oh, do you know what happened to me at the client last weekend? Oh, oh, that's a really cool outfit. Oh yeah, we, we have to have our little squirrel time, right? But she time boxes it, because our product owner is our analytical. <laughs> so he's sitting there smiling and nodding, patiently waiting for us to get to the backlog, to get to the data, right? So she's a very wise scrum master in that regard. She's planned a versatility plan for this team to be more effective based on our behaviors with one another. So our analyticals, you gotta come with your 40 meg pivot table. You gotta come with the details about the backlog. You gotta come with your questions, right? You gotta get right down to business with our analyticals. You do not wanna be too giddy you do not want to be too casual or rush decisions. So we don't want to be disorganized when working with the folks who are analytical. Now here's what Harvey offers uh, as what he calls versatility tips. So Scrum Masters, if you're going to uh, lead some sort of session on creating a team working agreement or just getting people to come to some sort of awareness about the behavior patterns in each other for the purpose of getting along. He likes to point out, from the military background and those teams he's worked with, he said, some of those guys, Angela, don't even like each other. They respect each other. And they have rules of engagement. They have ways that they can get together and get the job done. So human beings generally like working with other human beings. I mean, that's, that's generally the way that we're wired. We're social creatures. But you've heard the old adage, you got one of these and two of these. So Harvey says, you can't listen when you're talking. So we have to be OK in the moment to stop and listen and actively listen. And nothing you can do or say will motivate another human being. Psychologically speaking, there is no such thing. Our Agile Manifesto actually acknowledges that. Principle number five, right? We want motivated individuals. We give them the environment and the support that breeds that self-motivation. Any of you who have children know exactly what I'm talking about. You cannot change free will, can you? Because if you know, share. You can create an environment of self-motivation. So now we want to tell people how to interpret what we're about to say. It is day three at this conference, right? Have you noticed that a lot of us are losing our voices and getting pretty hoarse? It's those happy hours, all that socialization in the hall, talking over loud music, or even just the fans blowing cold air on us. So if we had to deliver a very important message, we might want to say with, I, I, I apologize, my voice is a little scratchy. Uh, I do want you to understand what I'm saying effectively, so I just want you to understand the way my voice sounds has nothing to do with the message. Otherwise, it's not going to land effectively, because they might make bad assumptions about what's really going on. So we don't want our tone to mismatch what we're saying. And if it does, for whatever reason, health-wise, circumstantial, explain that 
start with that explanation. Don't overlook orientation, regardless of whether it's gender, culture, and so on. I had a scrum master who was trying so very hard, but just in her DNA, it was never going to happen. Now, I got lucky, because I have a very, very good friend from Nigeria, so I know a lot about that culture. And this woman was Nigerian, and the team was all white men. And she would not speak, she would not confront, she would not you know, step up. And when I sat down and talked to her and started with, hey, my very good friend, who's also a Nigerian woman, has taught me how you are to behave in your culture. And her eyes welled up with tears, they got really big, she sighed, her shoulders slunk down, she's like, I've been so afraid to say I can't be the scrum master. And I'm like, it's okay. Let's, let's find a new home for you in the organization. Because she's a very talented, very smart individual. It just wasn't going to work. It's just the way she's wired, right? But nobody was willing to acknowledge that in that environment. So don't negate that stuff. That's, that's a pretty big deal, right? So we got to go beyond just the garden variety people stuff. And then we want to make sure that you know, these things all resonate with us from our manifesto and our guide. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I want to get to questions. But if you notice, everything he's talking about from the psychological point of view is perfectly reinforced by our framework. We want consistent goals. We want to trust each other. We want respect. We want to support team members, give team members credit. Look at all the opportunities in Scrum we have to do that. We have sprint reviews for them to show the working product. We have the retrospectives for them to talk about in improving. And we want to empower team members. That aligns perfectly with what we're asking for. And then my team's collection of tips that we've gathered over the last few years. Because as coaches and trainers, and many of us who are very enthusiastic about Scrum here this week, we sometimes forget not everybody is at the same place we're at, right? And we let the words get in the way. Do not inundate these people with the scrummy language. They do not care, right? And don't tell them, oh, that's not scrum. They might go, so? Well, why is that important, right? Or say, oh, you're not doing it right. You immediately set them on the defensive, and they are not going to listen to anything you say next. So we want to make sure that we're using better word choices by saying, you know, let's just not talk about the scrummy language for a minute. Just talk to me about why we're doing this. Talk to me about what the goal is. Right? Go back to Harvey's magic question to get the conversation in a more positive, constructive direction. And then the one that sets a lot of us off, of course, in the real world, I'm a, I live in the real world. So one of the ground rules in my class is you are not allowed to start a question with that phrase. Because when you start the phrase, in the real world, what did the person just do to themselves? What did they just do? They absolved themselves of responsibility. Oh, it's not me. It's just the system, right? Oh, I'm just the victim here. So we are all part of our own reality. So I prefer that they start the question with, in my current reality, can I tell you what's going on? Of course. And let's talk about what you can do in that situation. But we want to make sure that we're owning that, that we're not letting that go as individuals. So I, you know, change is hard to me. That's a cop out. Is anybody in here not aging a day? <laughs> yeah, you're changing, right, by the minute. So instead of saying change is hard, guys, change happens. So I'm going to invite you to replace the word change in your vocabulary with what's next. What's next? Are we ready for what's next? What's next? Change is not hard. It's hard for those who are not ready for what's next. So we only have about uh, 10 minutes, so I want to invite uh, some questions from the group with the time that we have remaining. Does anybody have a question or anything they'd like to add or a thought that any of the information triggered? Yes? In my current reality? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Exactly that way. When you're sitting down having a tough discussion, and somebody leads with any of those phrases, we listen for those, right? Because those are kind of trigger words. Because when somebody is just pummeling another person with a bunch of agile vocabulary, the other thing you can do as a coach or a scrum master, watch the person receiving the information. And what are you looking for? Eyebrows. 
You are looking for expression. If you see this, do they understand a word that was said? No. And as the facilitator or the coach in the room, that's your cue to step in and say, I'm seeing some confusion. Let me see if I can help. Let's dial it back to why we're doing this. What's the goal? What do we hope to gain? And that also lets people save face because they might be very defensive, not understanding all the vocabulary, but they might be too afraid to ask, right? Because our ego sometimes gets in the way, which is a whole other topic. Does that help? So just you're going to have to kind of work it in, and you can even work it in at home, right? Or practice. Heck, practice out here at lunch, right? Oh, you say that. Yes, by doing just what I asked you to do. Now be careful with putting people in boxes, because that's what Disk and Myers Briggs does, and they kind of miss the point, but they, you know, scaled everything down. So let me go back to the quadrant. So what you can do, and you guys will all get copies of the slides from the Scrum Alliance website. So you, the way I've used this in retrospectives is I will literally print this, bring it, give them a five minute time box, have them circle the behaviors that most resonate with them. And I wouldn't even tell them why you're doing it, only because you don't want them to game the system, you don't want them to overthink it, you want it just right from the gut, like boom, where's your home plate? Then I would do the big reveal and talk about those do's and don'ts and get those on the table. We did that with one of our clients. Um, it was a, a team of mostly amiables and there was one driver on the team and she was driving everybody absolutely nuts. And the discussion that came out of the retrospective was so good because the woman who was the driver honestly had no self-awareness about how the others were seeing her. She thought that was positive behavior because that had been reinforced in the positions that she had had. And when we were talking about versatility and embracing our differences, she goes, why would we want to do that? Doesn't everybody want to be like everybody else? We had a long way to go, but even having that conversation got them on such a much better path because the amiables don't like that confrontation. So nobody was willing to take her on when she would swing by in the moment and start barking orders and things like that. So then you said you had a second one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, remote teams, yes. So my team is a distributed team. Um, so when we do some of our events, sometimes we're on Google Hangout. Sometimes we're on the phone. So I would ask that you leverage the tools that you have. And Luke Coleman was here sharing some of his tools. You could easily work this into his tool. Um, you could easily work this into a WebEx, right, and use some of those. You may have to mute the screen or use the whiteboard feature in GoToMeeting or the polling. Right, and then share the information. Does that help? Thank you. We have five minutes. I see a hand here, here, here. Okay, I'm gonna start here and then I'm gonna go this way and then I might need my scrum master. Help me keep track. Right, so you're gonna have to ask permission. That's a big thing for me because don't overlook culture, and it's not just heritage, it's corporate culture as well. But when you talk about personal, I mean, all we talk about in Scrum is working together. Of course it's personal, of course we want to get to know each other. Is anybody in here a fan of uh, Brene Brown? Have you watched any of her vulnerability stuff? Yeah, and she's talking in there about if we're willing to even just share like a hobby or an interest with another team member, now we might be willing to be vulnerable when we need it about work stuff. So I would ask permission, I would know your audience, because we did have a really um, tough, passive aggressive environment where an uh, overzealous scrum master went in with some of this kind of stuff without asking the team. What do, you ask? do I have your permission to do, what? to do a retrospective technique with you that's going to identify some of our behavior patterns so that we can have an open and honest conversation about that? And if they say no, you don't do this technique. And sometimes you're pretty good in HR. Well, that one wound up in HR because she didn't ask permission. <laughs> and the coworkers were all like, why do I have to share this? So I would, I would not let common sense go out the window. Make sure that you're respectful. 
I always tell my scrum masters, all those pretty values, don't go out the window just because you're not talking about a scrummy subject. Do not forget about respect, right? So we want to ask their permission. There were a couple, I want to go over here because we haven't had one from over here. Seems a lot of what we're talking about is how to help build effective teams. Um, what percent of the time I'd say we should agree that sometimes you can find people Right. So if you could hear the question, he said, what about those people who just are not going to play nice? Right. It's just not going to work no matter what you try. Uh, if you do read Harvey's book, he calls those dark angels. And he said those people probably shouldn't be on any team. <laughs> but we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. So we want to find out what would make it better. So what can we try? And once we've exhausted everything in our toolkit, Scrum Masters, you are going to have to be that servant leader to the organization. You might be the person going to HR. You might be the person going to a functional manager and saying, hey, here's what we've tried. This person is just shopping on eBay all day and just ignoring the team and having a whole lot of nothing to do with us. What do you want to do? What are the options for this person? Because sometimes they'll be relieved that we brought it up because it's more respectful to them to say, this just isn't working out, because we are preventing them from moving on to an opportunity that might be better for them, too. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. One more. I think we have time for one more. Yes? You mentioned Harvey's magic question, but I, don't, I can't find it in the Why are we doing it? What is it? How are we going to do it? And who's it for? So if you can work those four words into anything you're saying, and it doesn't have to be in one sentence, it can be in four sentences or a couple, you're gonna hit all the dominant behavior types. And incidentally, at the tail end of his career, he was asked to review uh, presidential speeches. And he would work the four magic words into every speech. Because then everybody was like, oh, the president's talking to me. Because they were hitting exactly what they were trying to say. One more question, since that one was short. Yes, sir. Is, that was a really great question. He said, is there one of these behavioral types that's more suited towards scrum masters? I would say these all have the potential to be great scrum masters as long as they are aware of what their home base is. Because those of you who are analyticals, you probably love burn down charts. <laughs> but I don't want you in those burn down charts at the expense of the people stuff. The drivers, you probably love reminding them of the sprint goal, but don't focus on that stuff at the expense of the people stuff. I think those of us who are down here in the motor part, we go to the people stuff more readily than the other two, but that doesn't mean the other two are not capable of it. They just need more awareness and work on that versatility. Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm a recovering project manager. It's been 12 years since my last project. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, I liken it to a recovery because muscle memory kicks in, right? And then it just falls right back. I have not touched Microsoft Project for 12 years. Yes, 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 thank you. Oh, I'm so glad I finally got to say it. Um, so I ran towards the people stuff. I ran towards the people stuff. So our time box is up. They're furiously waving the done signs at me. But I want to thank you all for your time. I'm going to hang out for a few minutes. So let me know if you have questions. But we are going to be respectful of the next person and get them up here. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>